Welcome, everyone. Welcome. That's such like lovely mood music to get us uh, to, to gather us together. I am absolutely thrilled to welcome all of you uh, to this second installment in our Rhodes Technology and Society series. We, of course, wish we could be at Rhodes House and welcoming you in Oxford, but uh, we're thrilled that through the, the, the magic of uh, Zoom, we can gather virtually. And so we are holding a series of virtual panels exploring how technology is shaping our world and ways that we might influence its social impact. The first of these uh, focused on cybersecurity. And today we're going to turn to a topic of huge interest to many uh, across the Rhodes community and of course beyond it, big data in healthcare and biomedical research. And we're thrilled to welcome an all-star panel of Rhodes alumni who are each in different ways leaders in, in the biotech field. And uh, the scholar organizers were telling me how they, they got their, the, the first people that they invited all said yes. So we're really, really thrilled uh, to welcome our panelists. I'd also like to thank Rodolfo Lada and Georgie Thurston for their wonderful work as always designing, co-designing with scholars and, and arranging these events and making them go so, so smoothly. And I wanna welcome all of you. Our participants today include scholars in residence, Schmidt Science Fellows, Oxford students and faculty, as well as Rhodes alumni from seven decades. We will be joined from folks from the 1950s to the 2020s. So we're really delighted to have you all with us. I'd like to introduce our moderator, Peter Holderreich, who's Germany and New College 2019, for those who know how uh, these, uh, these Rhodes uh, uh, identifiers work. And he will be introducing today's topic and the panelists. So Peter is a mathematician from Bonn, Germany. He uh, has completed two master's degrees in Oxford in statistics and in neuroscience. And he's been really busy. He's collaborated with researchers from Google DeepMind, on publications in leading machine learning journals. He's built AI models for analyzing brain MRI scans at the Big Data Institute. And he studied the genetics of Parkinson's disease using CRISPR technology. And on top of all that, just like our panelists, he's a bit of a Renaissance man uh, or, or person who has helped keep our community strong through the pandemic and his role as co-leader of Rhodes Arts where he has performed as a musician and help to organize wonderful virtual and in-person open mic events featuring the talented musicians, poets, spoken word artists, dancers, and other performers from the Rhodes community. So Peter, uh, we're delighted to have you moderating and I will turn it now over to you. Great, uh, thank you very much uh, for this nice introduction, Elizabeth. So welcome everybody to our uh, technology and society event also for me. Um, it's great to see so many of you here, especially uh, the Rhodes alumni and the many Oxford University students which will join us today. When we're starting to organize this panel on, on biotech, we started to think about new biomedical breakthroughs in recent decades. Things which came to our mind were the genetics, which allow us to predict disease even before the cures. We are thinking about AI, which can diagnose disease based on radiological images. Or we're thinking about the smartphones which accompany us every day and track us on real time. And if you look at all these biomedical frontiers, they all underlie a, a common theme. It's the exploration and analysis of large data sets. It's often said that data is the new oil, meaning the, the key resource of our economy. But really data is also becoming the new microscope of the modern scientist and the stethoscope of the modern doctor. And in this panel, we would like to explore what that means. I'm very happy that today we have distinguished experts uh, in this important topic among us. So first I would like to introduce uh, Sir Peter D Donnelly. Peter is the founder and CEO of Genomics PLC, a spin-off from the University of Oxford focused on precision medicine and therapeutics powered by genomics. Peter was a professor of statistical science at Oxford and is internationally, internationally known for his research in population genetics. Peter, it's great to see you uh, again, and thanks for being here. It's a huge pleasure. Thank you very much. Second, I would like to introduce Dr. Vivian Lee. Uh, Vivian is the uh, president of Health Platforms at Verily Life Sciences, a subsidiary of Alphabet, focused on life sciences. 
She's also a success, uh, successful author and a senior lecturer at Harvard Medical School and Massachusetts General Hospital. Previously, she was the Dean of the Medical School and CEO of the University of Utah Healthcare. Vivian, thank you very much for, for taking your time. Hey, wonderful to be with you, Peter, and with this panel. Thanks. Third, I would like to welcome Dr. Vishal Gulati. Uh, Vishal is a venture capital investor focused at the intersection of data and health sciences. He's also a partner at the leading European venture capital firm Draper Esprit. He invests and sits uh, on the board of many companies many of us uh, might know. Uh, for example, Evonetics, Push Doctor, Zoe, Arcturus, or Quid Genius. Vishal, thank you very much for being here and it's a pleasure to have you. Thank you very much, Peter. Thanks for inviting me. So first we would like to take a, a look at the role of big data sets in biomedical research. Many of us might've heard uh, about the Human Genome Project or the UK Biobank. Peter, you have led many big international collab research collaborations in genetics. Could you give us some insights on why these projects were so crucial for biomedical research? Thanks, Peter, um, and it's a pleasure. There have been, as you say, a number of large projects, the Human Genome Project. Actually, it's, it's 21 years and about two weeks since the, um, the US President Bill Clinton and the then UK Prime Minister Tony Blair announced with considerable fanfare the draft sequencing of the human genome. They made multiple um, predictions about how disease would be a thing of the past. Bill Clinton said, in the future, cancer will be something that our children only know as a star sign. Um, there have been many projects since then, actually, I think in terms of the Human Genome Project, uh, it, it's, it's timely that it's 21 years, because we're, I think, at a really exciting point where those early, and I think at the time, overly optimistic predictions are about to be fulfilled. I think this work will have huge impact in, in healthcare in a number of ways. Um, as you mentioned, since that time, there have been multiple other projects, and I was lucky enough to be involved um, in several of those, the HapMap Project, the Thousand Genos Project, and the UK Biobank Project amongst them. Um, why have they had, what has been the impact and why has there been so much impact? I think one thing worth saying, and it's important for today's theme, is that genomics as a field has a very, very strong tradition of making data openly available quickly. Uh, the Human Genome Project uh, draft sequences were sort of put on the web almost the day that they um, came off the sequencing machines, and that tradition has continued. And I think one of the reasons those projects have had such a massive impact has been how accessible the data is. Uh, uh, another reason is that those data sets in increasingly sophisticated ways speak to and facilitate our ability to understand the role of genetics in human disease and in healthcare. Uh, there was initially substantial impact you know, from HapMap and the, and the Genome Wide Association studies was, which followed in our understanding of fundamental biology, in our knowledge of the genetics um, of common human diseases. Um, uh, and that in time is starting to power advances in healthcare, both in its use in drug discovery and finding better drug targets, um, and in understanding our risk for diseases. So uh, I think one of the most exciting areas, and it's one that uh, I and, and we in Genomics PLC are very focused on, is on getting using those insights to get much better at prediction to work out what diseases are a risk for particular individuals, which individuals are at high risk for certain diseases, and to get them into the right pathways, whether they're screening or treatment or prevention as early as possible. So those, those big studies have had a massive impact, but actually I think the impact on healthcare over the next uh, five years or so will be really, really substantial. Great, thank you very much for, for these insights. So from research, we now actually, you made the transition already for me, uh, we go to healthcare. So Vivian, you're, you were trained as a, a medical doctor um, at Harvard Medical School. But now you work for, for Alphabet, um, one of the largest technology companies in the world. What made you believe um, that a tech company could solve uh, important issues in healthcare? Mm. Yes, thank you, Peter. And, and thank you also for uh, the invitation to be on this panel. Um, you know, even though I, I'm trained in healthcare, my roots, actually, my postgraduate, my first postgraduate education was in medical engineering at Oxford. Um, and I think I've always been drawn to that intersection of technology and medicine. And in my academic career, I found myself responsible for research uh, for a large medical system, an academic medical system. And 
while we were continuing to push scientific advances and discovery forward uh, at, a, at a really remarkable accelerated pace, um, as, as Peter has just alluded to, I really struggled with reconciling what I was hearing and reading in our scientific journals, hearing in our lecture hall, and the data that I was seeing about our overall health of the population. And in particular, for example, in the US, we are distinguished by our uh, low overall health outcomes and our exceedingly high expenditures on healthcare compared to other high income uh, nations. And that's, if anything, it's gotten worse. You know, even before the pandemic, I think the average baby born in America lives four or five or six years less uh, than the average baby, say, born in Germany or in Israel or, um, and, and we, we spent you know, at least two times as much in healthcare. And so, and that's only gotten worse in COVID, actually. That gap has widened. Everybody's life expectancy has gotten worse, but it's, uh, it's even worse in the US. So clearly there are challenges in the delivery of healthcare. And I, while I studied many success stories across the country in terms of um, places that have really distinguished themselves in improving health outcomes and solving particular problems. What I felt was really necessary was uh, an accelerator, a kind of a leapfrog strategy over so many of the existing barriers that we face to improving our healthcare system. And I think technology sector right now really offers tremendous promise. It's not a given that it's going to realize all its potential for good. And that's why I think we need a lot of uh, a lot of people in healthcare and life sciences engaged in the technology sector as it's developing products and solutions. But I think a couple of examples are around digital health, um, how we can really use the ways in which technology companies think about individuals as consumers, not as patients, and have really mastered um, A-B testing and sort of psychographic profiles to engage people and figure out what matters to them so they really engage. We're, we've been missing that a lot in healthcare. So that ability to understand individuals and, and meet them where they are and what they need and then deliver those services through digital, uh, you know, highly accessible um, technologies like phones and tablets. And then I think also, of course, I'm sure as we'll discuss the use of the big data. So we've been digitizing our health records over the last decade, but we really haven't realized the potential of that digitization. So how can we do what Peter just described around genomics? How can we do that across the entire suite of data that we have about individuals, um, whether it's already being collected now in our health systems and in medical records, or what could be collected through, through genomics and other omics, as well as, for example, through sensor um, or even self-reported data about individuals. And how do we leverage all of that to do what Peter just alluded to, which is how do we predict um, who may be in need of earlier diagnosis or earlier interventions or prevention, for example, and just how do we get, that, get to that better engagement in health and then ultimately better health outcomes. So I think technology offers an enormous opportunity, but it, we're at, I think, a critical point where um, it's not a given that it will be totally successful. So there's still a lot of work to be done. And that was, great. That was very great. attractive. Yeah. And it's great to see so many of us uh, doing our best that this will happen. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> um, Peter, you too, yes. Um, so next, we would like to see from uh, the healthcare um, industry, maybe more to healthcare startups. Uh, Vishal, you, you made data-driven healthcare the leading theme of your portfolio. What made you make this decision? Why, would, why did you think that this is the key driver behind healthcare innovation? Um, thanks. Thanks for inviting me, Peter. Thank you for the question. Uh, so I think that the, the roots of that go back. Uh, I trained as a physician and when I started doing my research, uh, when I came to, came to Britain, I was very influenced by a, a Nobel laureate called Walter Gilbert, who was a geneticist, who was a physicist originally, but then a geneticist. And he had all these, uh, he had made these predictions that in the future, the, the one of the classic claims that he made, which was a long time ago in early 90s or late 80s, that in the future, uh, most biomedical research will start in front of a computer and end in front of a computer. And now it seems quite prescient what he, what he, he predicted. And, um, and, and at that time, he was talking about a, a world in which scientists will collect data from their experiments and they will put it on a repository he did not use the word online because I don't think the word online was in the dictionary at the time. 
because even the World Wide Web had not been not had not been been conceived, and and then he said that other scientists will go and download those. Or he did not use the word download. He said they will use that information to generate new hypotheses and then doing more experiments. And then the results of those experiments will go up to the world community for them to then harness the, the power of that. And I was I was absolutely taken in by that that vision. And so when I got the opportunity to work at the Genome Program at the Wellcome Trust, I just grabbed it. I left being a doctor. I thought, this is great. I think I want to see how, how this works. And uh, when I went in there and I realized that actually that's, so uh, I think Peter alluded to that, but the, the people forget that the world's first big data set was the gen human genome. At the time, there was no other data set that was bigger than the human genome. So now we have data sets which are bigger because the internet generates a lot of data. But that was the original. So the original algorithms of clustering and other things, everything was first tried on genomic data and then kind of other data sets, sets came about. So, um, and then I sort of looked at, um, so then after that I became a venture capitalist and I started to invest in biotech companies. But again, it felt more and more like cottage industry. So you basically had a molecule that you loved and then you just spent your whole life around that molecule and then in the hope that you'll find a drug that fits there. And um, when I started to see the internet sort of becoming, particularly through smartphones, when, when the penetration of smartphones started to rise, it, it was no longer possible for me to pretend that there, this will not have an impact on healthcare. And, and, and that's what happened, which is why I made data and connectivity as the theme of my, my, my investment. So uh, one thing that is worth for everyone um, who is wanting to be in the world of healthcare is that if you are looking for impact, digital is what gives you the impact. So if you take four, four or five companies in my portfolio that together don't employ more than 250 people, have helped 150 million people around the world with the apps and other products that they make. So the leverage that you get the scale that you get and the impact that you get from digital is unparalleled. And which is why I would urge everyone to drop everything that they're doing and go get into digital health. All right, all right. Uh, that's a great motivation. <laughs> um, so now I would like to ask a few questions um, to, to all three of you and you, you're very uh, much invited to share or to answer the question just from with given, give, like with your examples or with your work. So ideally, we all would like never to have a disease. We would like to avoid it. We would like to avoid going to a doctor. How can big data, or if big data enables us to predict the future, can it then also enable us to go from preventative care to uh, to, to go from re uh, reactive care to preventative care? Um, is that possible? And if yes, um, how? If uh, Vivian, you you would like, to, uh, if you could start, that would be great. Well, that's a that's a great question. I think that uh, we're seeing that play out, for example, right now in COVID and in the availability, uh, in the efforts to try to increase the number of people who have access to the vaccine, where the vaccine is already available, but the individuals are not necessarily, for example, in the US, the current situation here. And there's been, uh, for example, I was just looking at some data, there's in, in many areas, we suffer from, we, we don't have the advantages that Peter Donnelly was alluding to earlier about sharing all the big data sets. I think that's been a real challenge. But in this case, we have been sharing a lot more of the public health data sets about um, COVID and rates of vaccination, for example. And so um, I was just looking at some data that Ariadne Labs put together out of Boston, looking at vaccine availability and accessibility across the US. So immediately made publicly available. Like it's, um, I have to remember the name of the website. I think it's, it's a vaccine equity planner, I think it's called. And if you go on it, you can immediately see this is, I'm sorry, a very US centric answer, but um, with respect to prevention, it immediately enables public health uh, leaders and health system leaders to identify all of the counties across the country where individuals have to go more than 15 miles, for example, in order to access the vaccine. So um, there are so many ways in which we could use big data in the public health domain now 
where we have the opportunity because we have generally pretty weak public health infrastructures um, in many parts of the world to establish kind of leapfrog some of our existing underlying infrastructure limitations and uh, create common data standards and data platforms for people to be able to share whether it's what's happening epidemiologically or availability of resources, um, both personnel and supplies, PPE and so on, um, that can help us create a much more effective and resilient public health infrastructure. I think that's a huge opportunity for big data right now. Great, thank you. Um, Vishal, would you like to respond to this? Uh, no, th uh, thank you very much, Vivian. That's a, that's a really good example, I think. I, I, I find that uh, there are many examples. If we were just going to focus on COVID for a few minutes, um, in in the UK, for example, um, the uh, the way by why which the vaccine prioritization was done, that was a big data project. Uh, it was done uh, by collecting data from from all the medical records that exist and looking at coding of people who had chronic diseases or who had uh, high BMI. They were put in prioritized lists and, and other things, and that's kind of feels very small and boring, but it that was the bedrock of UK's vaccine program and, and partially responsible for the success. There was more work done in, in Oxford by Ben Goldacre and others around Open Safely. They were able to extract a lot of data from, from all primary care records to be able to have real real time information about how um, how the disease was spreading, who was, who was being affected uh, more severely and, and other things. So I think that it is now possible, which is, uh, I would go back to, to what Walter Gilbert said a long time ago, that many of these things can now start in front of a computer and end in front of a computer. You don't actually have to go out with clipboards and ask, start asking people questions because that data already exists. Great, uh, thank you. Peter, uh, if you could also share us how we could uh, go from reactive to preventative care, that would be fantastic. Uh, I'd love to, it's something I spend a lot of my uh, bandwidth thinking about. Um, I think there are huge opportunities, and let me give you an answer focused on the bit of that that I understand and know well, which is the piece around genetics and genomics. We've known for over 50 years, for most of the common chronic diseases in humans and the common cancers, that genetics is part of the story as to why some people are more likely to get the disease than others. And we've known that for some diseases, genetics is the major part of the story. Uh, environmental and lifestyle factors are important to differing degrees for different diseases. But until very recently, we've had no way of quantifying that genetic component of risk for diseases. And that's changed profoundly in about the last three or four years or so. So we know now that for any common disease, take uh, heart disease, for example, um, there isn't one gene or two genes. There are literally hundreds of thousands of individual positions in our DNA, which each have an effect, but a tiny effect on a person's risk of getting heart disease. So at this position on this chromosome, if you have an A rather than a T in, in your DNA code, you might be about 3% more likely to get heart disease. And over here on a different chromosome, if you have a C rather than a T, you may be half a percent more likely. So individually, they don't matter. But the obvious idea is to identify these positions for heart disease and then measure them within an individual and aggregate them. And that's now possible, and it leads to something called the polygenic risk score. You can just think of it as a, as a person's overall susceptibility, genetic susceptibility for that disease. And each of us will have a polygenic risk score for heart disease. We'll have a polygenic risk score for type two diabetes, which will be different, and it'll depend on a different million positions in our DNA. Um, the women uh, in the group will have a polygenic risk score for breast cancer, the men for prostate cancer, and so on. Um, as I said, it's only in the last couple of years that we've been good enough at identifying all those positions. And critically, we've had the resources to uh, uh, assess their impact. And, and UK Biobank, which we spoke about earlier, is one of those. And it turns out that the impact is really substantial. So if you take um, breast cancer, for example, um, and there are a couple of genes, BRCA1 and BRCA2, which have a big impact on a woman's, woman's risk of breast cancer. But putting that aside, women, these polygenic risk scores differ between different individuals, some will be high and some will be low, but the women who have high scores, say in the top 3% for breast cancer, their lifetime risk of breast cancer is well over 30%. Whereas the women in the lowest 3% for the polygenic score, their lifetime risk is 2 or 3%. Breast cancer is an interesting example because there are other risk factors for breast cancer, but in fact, 
the genetic component, the polygenic risk score, captures almost all of the risk you can measure in a population. Or to put it another way, if you're trying to predict a woman's breast cancer risk, um, and I use the polygenic risk score, and you use that and anything else you can measure, you might do one or 2% better than I do in prediction. Uh, you know, 95 or 98% of the predictive power comes from the polygenic risk score. So in that case, we can identify women who are at high risk from breast cancer who are currently completely invisible to the health system. What would you do uh, once you identify those women? You'd start screening them earlier via mammograms or in some cases, MRI. In the UK, we screen all women for breast cancer at age 50. It, it's crazy in the light of this. We should be identifying the high risk women and screening them much earlier. And actually the low risk women, we probably don't want to start screening at 50. We could screen them at 55 or 60. Um, in other diseases, and heart disease is a good example of this, you know, again, uh, for men where heart disease uh, has a higher baseline rate, men in the top few percent of polygenic risk score have something like a 40% lifetime risk of heart disease, and men in the bottom few percent have a three or four uh, percent lifetime risk. So again, huge differences based on the genetics you inherit. Now, in heart disease, we already predict risk in healthcare. Um, we use cholesterol and blood pressure and BMI and uh, sex, whether you're male or female, and so on. Um, it turns out that if you add in the genetic component, you can do that prediction better. And so that's a natural thing to do there. So in, in, in the case of some diseases, the genetics by itself will be really powerful at identifying the individuals who are at high risk. And in other cases where we already predict risk, we can do that better. Um, what do you do then? Well, you use that information to get the right individuals into the right programs, whether they're screening programs, prevention programs, or treatment programs. And you know, I think this really is ready for prime time where Genomics PLC are running pilot projects this year in the UK with GPs, so primary care physicians in the North of England to assess combining, how, do, how does it work in practice? You know, we've, we've done the theory, we've validated it in hundreds of thousands of people from different ancestry groups. Um, how does it work in practice for the doctor and the patient? Well, we're doing that study and we're doing another study with the Stanford Healthcare Systems in the US. Um, but the potentials there across many, many diseases. And with one genetic test, you can identify the high risk people for cardiovascular disease and those high risk for breast cancer and those high risk for prostate cancer and so on. And we can really start to predict that in advance. It's giving rise, Peter, to a whole new area of, of medicine called genomic prevention. The idea that we can do exactly what your question hopes. We can move from being reactive to getting much, much better at predicting the people who are at risk and getting them into the right programs early. So I'm hugely positive, as you can tell. Great, yes, yes, uh, that's fantastic and inspiring. Thank you. Um, so if we, we, we would like now to take a look at uh, what that makes with the industry. So as um, large data sets become increasingly important in healthcare, how does that change the dynamic between small companies and, and bigger companies? I think of big tech or big pharma and you're all at different positions. So um, would like, like to hear your perspective on, on that. And if Vishal, if you would like to start, that would be great. So uh, can you please repeat your question? Sorry, Peter. Oh, sorry. Um, so I, I was asking about the dynamics between small companies like startups and uh, bigger companies like big pharma or big tech, and how does the importance of big data influence this dynamic? So um, uh, I think that um, what seems to be happening is that in, in at least in the pharma industry, if you look at the interaction between big companies and small companies, it is quite well defined, and it is it is a relationship that that has been enshrined in 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 the industry. So a lot of big companies need small companies to identify new products, which they can then uh, produce or or take forward in phase three clinical trials. So that relationship still exists and is still strong. Um, and I think that. Where I, I find uh, some change happening is that there are more and more startups that don't want to work with or for big pharma and but want to become big pharma. So if you look at companies like Recursion, for example, they are not going to do a deal with, with Pfizer and another deal with GSK. They will be the Pfizer and GSK of the future using their big data platform. So I think that the level of ambition that some of the founders now have and their abilities because of big data technologies, uh, they are now able to do things which, they, which founders before them could not do. You might, you know, as I was saying, a lot of biotech was cottage industry and people, people like, like in Citro and, and Recursion and others are trying to change that from, and Verily, uh, I, I should mention, 
uh, are trying to change that into a more data-driven platform-based approach. And I think that will be slightly disruptive in that industry going forward. And I'm very, very excited about that because I'm hoping some of the companies I've invested in will be the recursions and incentives. Great, yeah, we'll, all, we'll also, we also hope for that. Um, Peter, you, I, th I, I know your, your uh, company also collaborates with uh, big pharma companies, so I would be curious to hear your perspective as well. Uh, yeah, actually, let me start off by um, echoing a point uh, Vivian made when talking about her own uh, personal journey, and that is, um, you know, that gap between the extraordinary science and the impact on healthcare is what drove me six or seven years ago to give up my academic um, career and start a startup, exactly because I felt we could and should focus on bridging the gap and actually bringing the impact from the science into healthcare. Um, Data is a massive part of that, and uh, within our company Genomics, we spent six or seven years building a very large data resource um, in a kind of old-fashioned way by, by sucking in literally thousands of individual data sets and harmonizing them, doing the QC, and, and developing the tools to analyze them together. Um, in terms of your question, Peter, you know, I think size of data is a big issue. It, it matters hugely on your ability to do things, and the larger companies have big advantages. They have the resource and often the forward-looking vision to be able to do things that are bold and large scale that smaller companies might dream of but not be able to execute you know because of the size scale and funds involved so that's that's an issue um i think investors uh, vishal and and many others like him who see this clearly uh, have a key role to play um you know as a small company what you want to do is uh, if you have the vision and there's something that you can't achieve because of the scale, um, but the case is strong enough. In my experience, there are investors who are prepared to take the risk and say, these are really good people, that data would make a big difference, let's back them to, to take that forward. Um, I, I, Vishal talked a lot about the biotech and pharma interactions. They're kind of somewhat different things, but, but um, a bit analogous in the health tech sector where you're developing new products, you know, those still need trials often large trials in real healthcare systems, they're also expensive. Uh, and again, would be out of the reach of small companies without the help of investors. Um, but, but at the moment, there's a huge amount of appetite and um, a lot of potential, I think, for the right kinds of compelling stories to get the funding. So, so it is an issue. So large companies, um, you know, Vivian will be well placed from the Verily perspective, they can just do things that are audacious and really interesting. Um, that smaller company have to work hard at, but it's not totally out of reach, I think. Great, um, uh, Vivian, could you, what you work at a, uh, I guess a rather small company at a very, very big company uh, focused on life sciences. So what is your perspective on, on that? Yeah, so I, I agree with uh, what Michelle and, and Peter have said. I, I, digital health is such an interesting space right now because it's really, in my view, in its infancy, everything feels, uh, it, Every, it's not exactly greenfield because it's such a heavily regulated <laughs> industry, but it feels that way. And so there's just so much energy that is perfect. Um, it's a perfect environment for lots of startups, right? Because let's just take digital, digital health apps, you know, We've got maybe a handful of companies that have had a handful of years of experience in, say, type 2 diabetes, depression, and maybe hypertension, and maybe pregnancy, you know? But think about the whole span of healthcare. I mean, we're just at the very earliest stages. So there's so much opportunity for that innovation and that, um, that agile kind of accelerated progress that happens in small startups. And there is an enormous amount of capital out there right now. So um, I, folks like Vishal um, are very interested. Look how hot he is. I, I feel like you need to come and be our recruiter lead because, uh, you know, <laughs> absolutely. We hope everybody gets into digital because there's such a, so many startups out there, so much work to be done. Um, and so, and with the capital to match, I think that there's just a huge amount of opportunity. In, in larger companies, I, I agree that they do, of course, have an inherent advantage. There's more stability. They're not, you know, we're not worried in, in terms of, you know, getting through the next quarter and our cash flow. Um, but 
because, especially in the space, I guess, that I mostly live in, which is software, software as a service, software as a medical device, it is, as Vishal pointed out, more cost effective. I mean, you don't need as many software engineers. I think Google might have maybe just 120,000 employees right now, and we have eight products that touch more than a billion users regularly. So, you know, that's kind of the advantage of the efficiency. And so, even though uh, there are generally inherent advantages in large companies over small companies. I think that gap is, is diminished in digital health. And then the one other thing that I'll say is that um, I do think that a lot of the big companies are trying to do, they're, they're incorporating the thinking of Clay Christensen, you know, how do you, the innovator's dilemma, how do you have that startup mentality in the context of a large company? And that's why Google became Alphabet. And that's why companies like we used to be Google Life Sciences and then we were spun out into Verily Life Sciences. And now I was brought in three years ago to start the health platforms part of life sciences. So there is this desire in large companies to have smaller startups in order to kind of reap the benefits of both. Um, but most of our employees have, have hopped around. And I think our most interesting employees have done a little bit of work, at least in one or two startups, and then maybe gone through Apple or Microsoft or Netflix and then Google. And I just think, it's, it's such a wonderful time to be entering into this field because you there's a complementary experiences of startup tech combined with probably the most staid and boring field, which is healthcare. Most in the, and it's that intersection of the two where there's just so, so much magic. Uh, Great, thank you. Yeah, I was looking actually at the uh, website of Barely and all the products and I felt like there's so many new products, which seems to be so risky. It's, it's, it reminded me actually a bit of a startup. Um, really cool. Um, so a lot of uh, uh, people in our audience have um, asked us previously about uh, AI and the applications of uh, AI technologies in healthcare, and particularly uh, people interested in drug discovery. I would be interested, um, what will are the current bottlenecks to greater adoption of AI in drug discovery? We've heard that um, like drug discovery becomes more and more expensive, um, and AI seems to be a solution, maybe. So what, what, is, what is your view? Vishal, if you want to start, that would be fantastic. Um, thank you for the question. I think the, I think AI is being deployed more and more in drug discovery, and uh, but there are challenges. I think the biggest challenge is the process itself. It is very hard for because in general biology is a low validity environment. So every experiment we do, it does not predict the future very with with any great certainty, which is why we have phase three uh, clinical trial failures. If you imagine a drug which has gone all the way to phase three, it has gone through many, many steps of validation and then it still fails. So one of the challenges that AI-driven drug discovery companies have today is that it is quite hard to convince a hardcore pharma person who has seen many, many failures that because of some black box that that particular pharma person doesn't fully understand, something magical could happen. And I think that that, I believe, is going to be the biggest challenge, which is why almost all companies are now gradually coming to the view that they have to take these products themselves further down into clinical trials, because it is just no point trying to convince the other people that their tool, tool is better than other people's tool, because you're not speaking the same language. So that's one challenge. The second challenge is that Generally, these AI drug discovery companies, they start from uh, an engineering mindset. So people who start these companies are not always engineers, they're mostly engineers, but they start with a very engineering mindset. In other words, they're trying to solve a problem. And what they lack is access to biological data. So they start with publicly available data sets. So they will go and look at expression profiling data or whatever they can find. But then very soon they, they, they reach this gulf where they cannot generate any proprietary data themselves to be able to show that their tool really works. So that's another gulf that we, we, have, to, we have to deal with. So these are some of the challenges that I'm currently seeing, but I'm very, very excited about the field. Thank you. Uh, so Vivian, um, I guess uh, Alphabet can be considered as starting with an engineering or software engineering or mindset. And um, it, like very, very heavily employs AI in in in, in the healthcare uh, in health, also in its health, healthcare platforms. What what is your perspective? Like, what are the bottlenecks of AI in applying to healthcare? 
Well, I, I, I was going to say one thing about the, the drug discovery side, which is um, the getting to market through clinical trials, so the validation um, sort of face-to-face through trial challenges. And I feel there, um, I can talk about healthcare as well, but in the drug discovery and commercialization side, there are really important needs right now. I, back when I was at, um, at NYU and I was overseeing research there, we would uh, go to great lengths to participate in these clinical trials with big pharma, right? To make sure that our cancer patients and our immunology patients and so on have, uh, have access to these drugs. And um, it would, we, we would spend tens of thousands of dollars and then have research coordinators and all these things. And at the end of the day, on average, for most of these drugs, for most of these trials, each site on average might recruit one to two patients, despite an enormous amount of infrastructure that is put into it. And at the end of the day, these patients are not representative of the populations that we want to serve. And we've been hearing a lot about that um, in the last year or two, but of course, it's been a problem for decades. And so there's a huge opportunity, and this is a part of what Verily does. This was actually the cornerstone project before I started the clinical studies platform is how do we use large data sets to match patients with the right trials using more complete insights about them, including uh, their genomics, to identify who would be the best candidates for which studies and to ensure that the right distributions of these populations are represented. And the benefit for the pharmaceutical companies is that it enables them to accelerate um, the, the conduct of their trials and have more representative populations and you know, obviously serve, serve the need of the communities that they're trying to market to. So I think that's a huge opportunity in terms of, of big data and AI for drug discovery kind of on the other end. Um, when it comes to health, challenges in healthcare itself. I think the biggest cha- challenge or bottleneck, as you say, is really, we have large data sets now, but they're not really, they weren't collected for the purposes of improving the delivery system. And so they're really, standards are actually, healthcare data standards are really in their infancy, in my view. Um, as a result of you're really trying to label the data, just for example, if you wanted to look through a data set and predict who was going to develop back pain, there's probably 12 different ways or 15 different ways in which back pain is coded. People call it sciatica, l- l- you know, lumbar pain, back pain, whatever, you know, there's all these different terms, not standardized at all. Uh, when we were rolling out our electronic health record, um, at the first time I went through this process, maybe about a decade or so ago, I remember the EHR vendor coming to me and saying, Dr. Lee, you've mentioned wanting to use the EHR data for for the purposes of advancing research. Um, Does it bother you that the urologist would like to lump diabetes type 1, type 2, thyroid disease, all under one heading called endocrine disorders? I said, yes, I think that does reduce the utility of the data for all future research. But that's kind of what we have out there. We really don't have data standards. And... uh, and I think that if you don't have standards and you don't have accurately labeled data for our AI algorithms to be developed upon, then you know, you're, you're really stuck. It's, unfortunately, it's just garbage in, garbage out. So that's a huge opportunity. And, and maybe it ties to a question that I think would be interesting to discuss, which is you asked about small companies versus big companies. And I think there's a third player there, which is the role of the government. You know, is all of is this whole health technology revolution going to be undertaken completely in the private sector? Um, what is the role of government? What is the role of these uh, oversight organizations in ensuring standards, ensuring cost effectiveness and so on? I think that's gonna be really interesting going forward. Great, thank you. Um, I think we would like, I would very much like to discuss that question actually. Uh, before, uh, before that, I would like to give Peter the chance to, to um, also reply to that question. Um, uh, firstly, I'd, I'd echo Vivian's comments and uh, Vishal's comments. Just a few more, actually, to go back to something Vishal said. Um, I think actually there's an interesting schizophrenia amongst um, people in pharmaceutical companies, and it may depend on their um, level within the company. What, Vishal, you're absolutely right that some people have always done it one way, and they're not prepared. You know, I think I think they're skeptical, often rightly skeptical, that some yes. magical AI solution will solve the problem. Um, but there's a tension in the other direction where there are people often at senior levels in the company who have heard that AI and big data are going to make a big difference to drug discovery. And they are terrified that their company is going to somehow miss out on that. 
Peter, so, I want to know who they are. I need to sell a few companies to them. Yeah, they, there you are. Um, <laughs> so, you know, I think there's often a tension between those two things and um, the ability of the pharma companies to kind of really judge the magic solutions is often um, not very well correlated with the actual um, utility of those solutions, which is sometimes helpful and sometimes uh, unhelpful. I think the second comment I'd make, and it echoes something uh, Vivian said earlier, you know, that healthcare is sort of different in a sense that it is structured, it's heavily regulated, rightly heavily regulated. So it's kind of a different field from many of the areas where we've seen huge impact of AI, machine learning, um, big data, you know, clever software engineering and so on. You know, one example, um, as I heard someone put it once, the dictum of moving fast and breaking things makes a lot of sense in other contexts. It's a really bad idea to try and um, play that way in the health tech uh, and healthcare context. Um, so I think, uh, you know, I think people need to respect that this is a field where the shortcuts they're used to in general, don't, you know, everyone thinks it's going to be different for them, um, that somehow or other, while the last 15 instances of something like this ended up having to do a substantial trial, they're so clever that they won't need to. And, and you know, I think that naivety is un unhelpful. And then to go back, finally, to your basic question of whether there are uh, bottlenecks about uh, shortages in data access, data quality, and people, I think all of those are true at, at varying levels. Um, we're all competing for the very best people. Um, and there are a lot of really interesting opportunities for those you know, people who are early in their careers, who are good. There are a lot of very interesting opportunities. And, you know, it's, it's tough to recruit the, the best people, I'm sure. Um, you know, we would think from a dif distance that Google and Verily have advantages and indeed they do. But I bet Vivian's uh, and her colleagues would make the same point that, it, you know, it, it's becoming increasingly hard to make sure you get the very best people. Uh, I think while we're talking about people, I do want to uh, make a point, especially given the audience here, is that um, one of the things that I've been asking a lot of people in biology these days is that how well do, you, do they feel that their PhD students and postdocs are qualified in computing um, and in software? And I'm getting a lot of mixed responses, including some saying that they are very disappointed with the, with the level of bioinformatics and and computing uh, training many people with biological skills have. Um, and one of them at the Crick telling me last week that uh, he has now resorted to only hiring physicists and mathematicians because he can teach them biology faster than he can teach biologists how to, how to code. And um, I think that there are, and, and I've heard other ex ex views, completely the opposite views as well, so I think that this, this idea that you can be a very good biologist in the future without computing skills is going to be problematic. I don't think we can be anything good if we don't have, have some kind of computing and data skill. Uh, thank you, Vishal. Actually, a lot of people were also asking for career advice um, before that panel. So um, I, I'm very glad that we also have that included. Um, so actually, Vivian, I think you brought up a great question about like uh, policy and regulation, especially when it comes to data. There are a lot of, um, um, rightfully, there are a lot of uh, there's a lot of data protection. Privacy is something we I think we all we are all concerned about. And on top of that, new technologies like AI also give, bring challenges to um, um, how to approve certain technologies. For example, how to improve an AI algorithm? Do you approve the algorithm, the specific model, and these um, these challenges? So um, Vivian, uh, would you like to um, give us some insights on what you think what regul regulators have to do? I'm happy to, although I, I thought by asking the question, I'd be off the hook, but now <laughs> I'm happy to start the, start the discussion. And then I, I look forward to uh, Vishal and Peter's comments. Um, I, I think that there is right now um, a definitely leaning much more towards the private sector and in, in driving, and it's difficult for uh, the regulatory and oversight bodies to adapt quickly enough. Um, there's clearly a lot of uh, urgency around protection of privacy. So that's probably where we're seeing the most work, uh, which I think is absolutely essential. I think it's, uh, it's critical that we find that right balance where the services that we are able to provide in using individual data, well, first that we're very transparent about the use of data, and then that the data are used in ways that uh, provide value to the individuals whose data are being used. And I think uh, the, the role of governments right now in ensuring those protections are 
the standards are established and, and clear and satisfactory is absolutely vital to the success of our, our whole business. I mean, I, the day I came into Verily, I said, you know, it's all about public trust. Here we are, healthcare, big tech, we're at the intersection and we, we have to be as transparent as possible and, and as clear as possible and as safe as possible with people's data. So I think that's really important. Beyond that, I think there are issues uh, in terms of the regulatory side of um, one of the challenges of having it all be in the private sector is that sharing isn't always the top priority of, of most businesses, right? It's um, the COVID pandemic was an, a bit of an exception, but I think for the most part, most companies want to keep their data to very close to their chest. And so there is very, you know, the issue of what we call interoperability. How do we get data from whether it's digital technologies to electronic health records to insurance claims data if you're in the US or public health record, you know, how do we get all those data sort of interoperable in a way that presents a coherent picture about an individual or about a, co about a community? We have a long ways to go there. And I think the government has to be able to step in there because left to its own devices, the private sector won't land there. And similarly, I think there's a lot of responsibility around um, overseeing the claims of these various technologies in terms of the, the you know, standards of evidence generation, sort of the work that say in the US, the FDA does. And it's tricky, you know, the Verily has been involved in this round table with the FDA for several years now around software as a medical device. And just to give you a flavor of it, if you haven't been involved in it, you know, typically for a medical device, looking for um, uh, class two or three approval by the FDA, you don't really expect that device to be changed that often. Like back when I was in the MRI days, you know, we might have a new MRI system upgrade every year or two. In software, we could have a release every day, every week. You know, it's it's very rapidly changing. So how do you regulate that? How do you ensure that um, that those products continue to meet the right standards? And again, that left to the devices of the private sector, I don't think is going to be successful. Similarly, I think there's been some work around AI. How do we ensure that there's not bias in our AI algorithms? How do we create some regulatory oversight over AI? That's a huge area that's just, I think, also pretty pretty early. And ho hopefully some of you will be involved in that as well. So those are just uh, those are just a few thoughts. Great, thank you. Wow. Um, Peter, would you do you have uh, any further thoughts on that? Uh, yeah, or, or perhaps a different perspective, because I think the issues are somewhat different um, in the UK, which I know best. Um, for a number of reasons. I mean, the UK government's much more involved in healthcare. We have a single payer healthcare system cradle to grave through the National Health Service, um, which looks after roughly 60 million people. So even by the standards of large American healthcare um, uh, providers, it's very big. Um, and in fact, there are massive advantages of having a single payer system and a single system for everyone. Um, there are huge, there's huge potential in the data in the National Health Service which I think government is aware of. It hasn't quite worked out how to extract that value, um, but it, I think it wants to try and be helpful to both um, the public sector research community and uh, the private sector community. So I, so I think uh, things are a little bit different and, and there are possibilities here that are perhaps not available in the US system. Um, I mean, both in, in the direct issues around the question, but actually also if you're making a case for prevention, that's a much easier sell to a health system that is responsible for people for the next 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years of their life than it is in the US where people move between um, insurers with remarkable speed. Um, I think in the UK, the regulators, or at least the ones uh, we've spoken to, want to be nimble and they want to learn about these technologies and they want to try and uh, adapt so that they can cope with some of the problems. But as Vivian has said on multiple levels, those are, you know, there are very substantial issues that need grappling with. And finally, uh, to pick up a, a point Vivian ended with and something Grace raised in the chat, um, you know, we need to be really, really careful with these technologies. Um, they have huge potential, I believe, to reduce health inequalities. Um, but actually, if we're not careful, they might exacerbate health inequalities. Uh, and in my own area, the polygenic risk scores I talked about, um, as Grace mentioned in the chat, um, they tend to perform better on individuals of European ancestry because all the large genetic data sets have tended to be on people of those ancestries. Um, so there's a real challenge for the field, both to improve the data sets that are available and the human genetics field to their credit are now on the case, relatedly, but they're now on the case, 
but also to be cleverer with methods to use the data well, um, and to make sure that when we roll these things out, we do it in a way that, that doesn't exacerbate actual inequalities or perceived inequalities, which will have indirect effects, which won't be good. Thank you, Peter. Uh, Vishal, do you have uh, other thoughts, other perspectives to add to this? Um, no, I, I think I, I agree with everything Vivian and Peter have said about it. I think it's really, really challenging. Each one of us that works in the field, we have a very strong obligation to ensure that the data is used well and used correctly. And we um, have the, the highest possible standards for, for uh, our conduct of our companies and also the use of data because it's all about trust. And um, we should not forget, of course, we governments will do what they do. Large companies will do what they do, but particularly as a community, we, we all have to remember that we all have agency and we must use that agency and we use our voices to continuously remind people in our community and people we work with, because it's, it's really, really hard uh, it, for all of us when some people are going to abuse data, some people are going to not be as careful as they should be. And it is, it is ultimately going to be detrimental for, for all of humanity. So I, I, don't, I take that responsibility extremely seriously. And I, I just wanted to also jump in to say that I, I feel in this conversation that it's worth noting how much we can learn from each other uh, from uh, nation to nation. So. For example, I mean, I would mostly say the U.S. has a ton to learn from everyone else. I don't know if anybody else has anything learned from us, but, um, but for example, in the NHS, having a single payer that does these cost effectiveness analyses before agreeing to pay for you know, diagnostics or for therapeutics and to have a standard uh, on which a, a reasonably rational standard upon which how to price these services, that, that is incredibly effective and important and something that I think in the US, for example, that we should be doing. So there are a lot of lessons. And as we navigate this sort of uncertain uh, future of digital health and data, I think we also have a lot to learn from each other there. Great, uh, thank you very much. It's a very, very inspiring, uh, a very, very inspiring words and also a, a word of caution, which I think is uh, very sensible here. Um, yeah, I think we are actually, we're already an hour in, we have 30 minutes left, which I would like to uh, give to our audience. And uh, I would like to um, invite you to ask questions uh, now to our panelists. Um, I could give you a few few seconds to think about. You can raise your, your Zoom hand. Uh, I think we already had a few questions in the chat. Um, if you prefer that, you can also do that. I've seen that uh, several of the questions in the chat were already uh, asked, um, but I'm, I'm very happy to um, to, to ask some of them. Barbara, you, you have uh, raised your hand. Uh, would you like to start? Great, yeah, thanks. Um, I, I do want to follow up both on um, I think Bill's question about data ownership, I do wanna make sure we get to that um, and, and the corollary of that being privacy. Um, but I'm kind of interested in, you know, as we talk about big data and all of this, we're seeing that ransomware is becoming a huge issue in health. And how do we deal with the effect of these ransomware and shutting down hospitals and medical care facilities and solutions of sharing data among you know, different providers and such or other options to ensure that medical care does not suffer while our, the data, which has become all digital, um, becomes unavailable for patient care. Is, um, if, if, that, if you don't pose that question to a specific person, I would, uh, I would like to, um, like I would like to invite all of you to to answer it, um, Barbara. Let me try and answer that. I think that in the last few years, it has become clear, which it wasn't to us, that healthcare data infrastructure is critical national infrastructure now. I think that the reliance we have on data moving between one organization to other for for care of people and and it is a matter of life and death. And I think that. 
unfortunately, this is a sort of a, a more a cybersecurity issue than than a healthcare issue. But uh, it is unfortunately a cat and mouse game, as cybersecurity always is. We just have to keep getting better at at the standards we use and the the systems that we we use. Uh, but uh, uh, people who want to profit from from their 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 activities like this, they will continue to evolve as well. So I think that I just keep I just hope that organizations will have sufficient resources to deploy for cybersecurity, which has unfortunately not been a priority for many many health systems. I think I, I would agree and I'd probably come in even more strongly to say that I think cybersecurity is really a national security issue and that expecting each individual entity, I mean, we don't expect each entity to, to mount its own uh, military force and to you know uh, be responsible for missiles or something, thank goodness. Um, but we really- I think you in know, the do, United States, you are doing quite well by passing <laughs> a lot of uh, that to individuals. <laughs> Yeah, well, this is, you know, it is the sort of American way, right? And the whole um, idea at state level and local level leaders, but this doesn't work at a cyber level, you know? And so, you know, you can imagine that within Google, and I'm not speaking on behalf of Google, but just to say that this, that in the technology space, um, there's a, a lot of work around securing our data and securing all the data on the cloud that the, you know, that uh, we're sort of responsible for. And, um, when you when you get a peek under the tent to see what's happening in the cybersecurity and the digital attack space, it's terrifying. I mean, and we're talking state actors. We're not talking about the mom and pop hospital system over there trying to steal my hospital data over here. You know, it's really at a level that's just completely beyond, I think, the capabilities of, of most of us. And in particular, health systems are so vulnerable because we're like, you know, I, I try to explain to my tech friends here in in, in in the company, we still have beepers and fax machines and CD-ROMs. You know, we're not exactly at the cutting edge of, of anything from a tech perspective. So we're particularly vulnerable, particularly vulnerable and poorly equipped to deal with it. So I, I think it's a national security issue. And this is something that has to be taken, you know, taken up at a higher level for sure. Oh, well, Vivian, I think that's a little bit of a cop-out. I think that, you know, for security, let's just put it in a simpler thing you have to be sure that you lock your doors and windows. You can't just sort of say, oh, it's the government's responsibility to prevent me from being robbed. And so oh, there absolutely, of course. Yeah, of course. I agree with you completely. All of our products have to have super, one of the things we pride ourselves in is that we have everything is super secure when you're working in Google Cloud or in, or in Azure or in many of these cloud systems compared to say locally hosted. I completely agree with you, Barbara, but I just think that no matter what you have at a local individual level, and we have to do a lot of training. And I just went through a whole anti-phishing uh, way, you know, all the spearing stuff training. We're all doing that all the time, but the level of sophistication of these attacks, it's, it's almost impossible for us to expect to be able to win and to not be subject to the ransomware kind of attacks that you're talking about through just this strategy alone. Right. I just think it's inadequate. That's what I'm saying. I'm not saying we shouldn't do it. Of course, please lock your doors, you know, and please, please do it as much anti-phishing training as you can among your staff and don't click on those attachments, et cetera, et cetera. But it's really, really difficult. Well, and then one last point, then you have to build resiliency into your systems. And I think that that's one of my points is how do you, how do the systems build resiliency when those security things fail? Well, that's also saying how, among the list of priorities for a health system that is in the US that is private. So it, again, I think we suffer a lot of disadvantages compared to say the NHS. How do we expect individual health systems that are operating on a one to 2% margin, negative margins post COVID to look through their list of priorities, including uh, in implementing digital health systems and getting paid by the government, this need to build additional uh, resiliency, additional um, support within their systems. It, it's, we need it to happen, but it, it's not gonna be a priority right now. I mean, and if you think about resiliency in the system versus building out a stronger public health or preventative care infrastructure or greater access to the 10% the, the of people who still are uninsured, or it's really difficult to see how this is gonna be a high priority. 
I'm, I, I hate to be so negative about it, but I, I do think it's a huge, huge issue that's not getting enough national attention or international attention for that matter. Thank you. Peter, do you have uh, any further thoughts on this issue? On, I'm no, sure I think my much... colleagues, uh, Vivian and Vishal, have covered it really well. <laughs> all right, all right. I'm, I'm not an expert on cybersecurity either, so I think um, uh, I'll follow you here. Uh, Kwang, um, would you like to share your question with us? Yeah, thank you again. Um, very insightful um, discussions. Um, I, I have some questions related to what Vishal raised earlier, um, in which um, for companies, when we went on the fundraising campaign, especially early startups, one of the challenges that we always get asked from the investor is, while well, you have a very robust computational kind of platform, but then you don't really have the path to reach the clinical application demonstration is kind of rough um, and the timeline is kind of too long. Um, I just want to hear from your perspective, what are some advice that you can give you know, companies trying to demonstrate that their platform does have some kind of clinical evidence um, you know, in terms of building partnerships, subsidiary models or, or whatever? Um, yeah, thank you. Um, thank you for your question. Yes, I think this is just like we were speaking earlier that the most common sentence spoken on Zoom is you are on mute. The most common response you get from a VC is that your company is too early stage. And so this is kind of the industry that, so there is always, investors are always looking to see if they can get more evidence, they can get more data, they can get more uh, more validity of what you are saying. So this challenge is, remains and this challenge will, will continue throughout your, your startup life. But I think there are, uh, you are, you are uh, fortunate to be part of a community which is very interdisciplinary. I think that I find many, many startups do not engage uh, enough with academic communities where, where they can find not only uh, willing participants in, in further research, uh, they can apply for grants, which they can jointly exploit with academic groups, like from Innovate UK or, or from MRC and from other, other sources. And I think that the, the job of a startup founder should be that by hook or by crook, you need to get generate more data for your startup. And because the moment you have, as you create more data, you have more people out in the world and luckily, there are many, many more venture capitalists in the world now than there used to be 10 years ago. You will be able to find someone who is going to say, okay, I think I'm willing to take, the, take a risk on this particular company. Yeah, thank you. Very uh, helpful. But remember, you only need one. That's, that's the most important thing. For your first, first check, you only need one. <laughs> All right, uh, thank you, Vishal. Um, you also, like uh, a lot of people um, pre-submitted a question about career advice, it's, uh, as I already mentioned. I think I would like to take the chance again of like asking you uh, regarding our topic on, on big data and, and biomedical research and healthcare, what does that mean for the skill set of the future? Um, and what does that, how, how people in, interested in the industry, how, what advice would you give to these people uh, for the future? And Vivian, oh. if you would like to, um, if you wouldn't, would like to kickstart it, feel free. Well, it looks like Vishal was ready to go. Vishal, do you, do you want to start? Uh, no, I, I, so I, I want everyone to, to build a startup at least once in their lifetime, if possible, more than once. That's what I would say. And I would want them to, to come to me if they want funding. Have That's you done that, Vishal? I, I have. Yes, I have, actually. So I have, I have done a couple of startups. They have not been very successful. But which is which does not matter to as far as I'm concerned. I think it's the process that matters as much as as much as the outcome. But I actually believe that if you really want to have impact, there are many things you can do with your with your life. But one of the things that you can do, and by the way, I when I first came came to Rhodes House, being a startup founder was not considered a, an option or at least a glamorous option to 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 go when you when when you when you graduated. You are very lucky. The times have changed. It now being a startup founder even passes the grandma test. If you go and tell your grandma that you are building a starter, even she will say, "Well done." 
I don't think that my grandma would have said that when I was building a startup. So I think there is so much going on right in this world right now. It, there is capital is becoming a commodity. It is the brains that is not the com commodity. So guys, you all have brains. You have some of the best brains in the world. Go and build a startup. How about that? Is that good good advice, Peter? You think? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, uh, I would say I, I would agree. Although I think my life experience is very limited. Um, <laughs> um, Peter, you have followed uh, apparently uh, Vishal's advice. What do you, what would you say? Yeah, I left it rather late in life, um, but <laughs> did uh, did get there eventually. Uh, uh, look, I think I'd say a couple of things. One is to echo a comment uh, Vishal made, which is, you know, the climate now is completely different, even from ten years ago. Uh, and certainly from 20 or 30 years ago. Um, the way in which an entrepreneurial path is seen as a valid, interesting and exciting thing um, is completely different now. So that's very positive. Um, I think in parallel with that, but, but different and also significant is the fact that these days, quite a lot of the best science in the world is now done in companies. That wasn't really true 20 years ago, and it wasn't especially true 10 years ago. Um, you know, Verily and, and the Alphabet companies are one set of examples, but uh, there are many others. There is extraordinarily good science um, done in companies. And for young people uh, early in their career who are thinking, who love science and are interested in science, it used to be the case that the obvious thing to do was to pursue an academic career. Uh, actually, I I was an academic for, for most of my career. I loved it. I'm incredibly positive about that path. Um, but actually, there is now a huge opportunity to do great science um, in the commercial sector. A lot of it with um, early stage companies, not all of it. Um, I mean, some of it with larger companies that used to be early stage. So I think, you know, just a very different uh, climate uh, with, with a range of options that wasn't available previously. And, and it's kind of a trite thing to say. And... Um, but I think really important, Vishal made the point, starting something as an entrepreneur and failing is actually a good thing um, and you learn a lot. So uh, don't be afraid of doing that. Uh, but having said that, it's tough. You know, you've got a lot of things to worry about. There are easier uh, career choices that will lead to you uh, not being stressed as much. Um, you know, other careers are still stressful, but, but um, it's exciting. There are lots of possibilities at a much wider range of, of options now for people than they were in the past. And, and I'd recommend people embrace that. Mm -hmm. Great, yeah, thank I, you. I'm so yeah, sure. I, I was... yeah, I'll just jump in now. So I, I totally agree with this. And I, I think when I, as I would distill what, what I've heard um, both Vishal and Peter say, and also my own experiences, you know, um, there is a generational difference right now. So like Peter, I was in academics my whole life and then sort of in a completely unexpected way landed over here. Um, but it's not the same in your generation. So, or in those of you who are, are closer to having, uh, I know there's a mixed audience here, but those of you who are um, closer to your graduate training programs. Uh, for example, back when I was at the University of Utah, we um, created a new track. So typically to graduate from medical school, you needed an academic endeavor, some kind of a project, a paper that you have to write. And we created a new option, which was a something called bench to bed, bedside, a startup, uh, innovation competition where medical students worked with engineering and business students to create a little startup. And that actually could, could replace, you know, and be, be counted for that scholarly project. And so I'm seeing that a lot more. Um, and I really, really encourage that. And I think what's, what's interesting about it though, is a couple of things um, now, again, taking an academic view to it is, I think what we're seeing increasingly is that what's important and valuable if, if you're interested in this space is not being taught in the classroom. So the skills that are necessary to be successful, uh, what Vishal is really advocating for is that real life skill of getting in there, trying to do something, making the pitch, figuring out a business plan, you know, kind of doing all things at once. Um, that's one dimension. I think another dimension of what's not being taught that, need, that should be taught or that I think most people need to understand, especially I would say from the healthcare side is understanding and maybe this is more US centered, so I apologize, but it's understanding the business of healthcare. So one of the reasons why I ended up writing this book, um, you know, so I wrote this book called The Long Fix was really to teach the medical students and new people into healthcare, 
how the business of healthcare works. I never understood that, you know, until I was pretty senior, I really didn't understand anything about it. And I think that's actually really important. And then there are other dimensions and, and capabilities like data science, I think, which we talked about earlier. Um, and the advantage is if, even if your schools aren't teaching it, I'm doing an online edX course from Berkeley on data science. I'm like doing my little coding in Python. I don't think I'm very good at it, but it's kind of fun. So people, if I can do it, you know, anybody can do that. So there are opportunities to learn things, supplement your education outside of the classroom that way. And then one last thought uh, that I had just when you guys were talking was what's hard about it. One thing I think that is actually hard uh, about doing a startup or for me, you know, we have a number of startups that I'm responsible for too. Um, that's maybe less hard for me now than it would have been had I done it kind of in the earlier phases of my life is the ability to work with people across very widely different fields. I mean, what's so interesting about it being in a startup is you don't just have engineers, software engineers or hardware engineers or product managers, you've got a finance person, regulatory or somebody who has to do these things, regulatory things, HR issues, you know, um, these creative types who create marketing information, communication, very different personalities. And if you come up through the academic track, you are generally surrounded by people like you economists who are like you, engineers who are like you, medics who are like you, and get to get thrown into this space and start to really learn about what it's like to work with people who are really intellectually very different, you know, have very different heuristic tools. I think it's actually fantastic. It's, it's hard, but it's actually kind of also a fantastic part of this experience. So um, I think I'm giving a, I think I'm giving a thumbs up to Vishal's recommendation, um, whether it's doing a startup yourself or getting involved in some way in, uh, in fields that are outside of what your core work is academically, if you're an academic, I think it's really great, really worthwhile. Uh, just one other thing, biology is the hottest thing right now, guys, come on. Physics has had its time, chemistry has had its time, biology's time has just now started. <laughs> all right, all right. And I, I can also assure all of you, actually, uh, having a startup is very all vogue nowadays at Broad's House, so um, that has definitely changed. Well, you know, in my time, if you wanted to be cool, you, you say, you would say, I'm with the band. Now you say, I have a startup. <laughs> That's what has happened. This is the rock music of our generation. This is the <laughs> punk rock, guys. Come on. Let's have more startups. So, Actually, so tell us about your cool band then, Vishal. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, Peter seems become, to have those. I, after my band failed, I've become a band manager. Now. That's what I have been reduced to. <laughs> All right, this, I actually have a band, so uh, that's a bit unfortunate, but I'll try my best to switch. <laughs> um, all right, I think we have one question which uh, where people are also very, very interested in, uh, which you can also see in the chat is uh, about data ownership. And, and Muhammad asks uh, that various companies are profiting, profiting from, from personal data, but little or none, none of the gains are returned back to the data donors. Is that fair or sustainable? Uh, so I, I think, uh, let, me, let me quickly say something before Peter and, and Vivian said, I think that that is the, the model which has existed in the past. And I think that we are already moving past that model. I think that uh, that model has, has been the dominant model in the non-healthcare tech industry, where people have shared their data willingly or not knowingly uh, with big tech companies and have, in return, received incredible products. But it is not clear whether that bargain has been a fair bargain or not, because it is everything is so nebulous of what we give we don't understand the full value of that. What we get, we don't understand the full value of that. So if Google Maps is tracking me wherever I go, but in return, I get a free mapping app, which allows me to travel the world, uh, which I wouldn't be able to do without it. Is that a fair bargain? I don't know that. And many people don't know that. But in healthcare, we have to go one step further. I think we cannot have this kind of ambiguous bargain because it's people's perception of risk, people's people's de desire for privacy, people's uh, uh, feelings are very, very different across the world. And uh, I think we have to address the question of whether there is fairness in this relationship. One of the trends that is now happening is, is that donors of data are indeed getting compensated for their data uh, more directly. So there is a company that I'm involved with, which is in Oxford called Sensign Health which is actually giving data back to NHS for giving money back to NHS 
and supporting the NHS for the data that they use very ethically. Uh, they use data which is anonymized, but they still give a part of their revenues back to the National Health Service. There are companies in the US that are copying this model as well. So I think there is progress happening and I think this is a space to watch. Peter, have you, uh, do you have any thoughts on how you deal with data ownership in, in your company? Uh, yeah, I do. Um, uh, look, I think it's a great and question and a really, really important area. A couple of comments. Um, the first one is that there's quite a lot of evidence that in general, people are happy for information about them to be used to further medical research that will be helping to make either themselves or people like them in the future, maybe their family, maybe uh, others better. So there's a hugely positive view, I think, um, of people towards data and medical research. To do that well, you need to do it ethically and transparently, and you need people to know as much as possible what they're signing up for, or to have bodies that can kind of sit, you know, where, where the data is already in a system, and it's being used, you need to, to have the appropriate uh, oversight to make sure that's being used in ways that the data owners or, or, or providers would have been aware of. Um, so that's, uh, you know, I think things are a little bit different in healthcare because there is a long tradition of, of people participating in, res in research studies, which are helpful. I think the other thing that's different from, um, and Vishal made multiple absolutely opposite points, but another thing that's a bit different um, from the world of you know, my data and Google Maps or my data and Facebook and so on, is that where data is in healthcare systems, it, it, you can't easily get it via the individual, via giving them something. You have to have a discussion with the healthcare system itself. Um, uh, Vishal's mentioned one example. Uh, my view, you know, in the context of the UK certainly, is that where, where data from the National Health Service is used by companies to develop uh, new methods, or new products, then firstly, the National Health Service and hence the original patients should be able to benefit that from that um, in a way that doesn't involve an, you know, a massive kind of uplift in price. And secondly, if the company involved, and, and you know, this is certainly a guiding principle for us, if the company involved uh, uses that data and develops things that it makes money from elsewhere, if the NHS data, for example, was a key part of that, it's absolutely right that some of that value goes back to the NHS and hence to the individual's and the system. So, you know, Vishal mentioned a sense line for one example, but I think as a general principle, that's really helpful. And it's quite a good general model for thinking about a use of healthcare data. Um, it has to be transparent. It has to be in ways that the data subjects are likely to be happy with. And we can either do that sometimes by asking them in advance uh, and sometimes by having the right oversight that checks. And then absolutely, I think benefits have to go back uh, in an appropriate way to uh, at least to the system and hence to, to patients generally, um, which might be a bit more natural in the case of healthcare data than somehow or other get, getting um, tangible benefits like money back to the individuals involved. Vivian, uh, what are your thoughts or yeah. your perspective on the issue of data ownership? Yeah, I, I don't have much more to add. I feel like Vishal and Peter have said it so clearly and eloquently. I. I do feel like the, the, what, the area I think that I struggle with the most, so, so I, I agree, I don't wanna repeat everything that's been said, but I, I do really believe that in the healthcare space, unlike the use of data to say, you know, choose your favorite movie in Netflix or something, the healthcare data is different and the way in which we, uh, I, I feel very strongly right now. In fact, the way in which Vishal is saying everybody should, should get into this space. I'm saying that to most of my healthcare friends saying, we need more healthcare expertise in the technology space because I think we wanna build products that are going to do good. And if, our, if, our, if the way in which we think of ourselves is all of these tools and technologies that have made people you know, addicted to potato chips and sit on their sofa every day and smoke too much, if we could sort of pivot that to using that same kind of know-how to improving health of the population, then we will have done a good thing. So. Um, but I do feel like one area that I've been really thinking about is, you know, there's been a lot of this discussion about the individuals who were on, on the trials to develop new, very expensive therapeutics, for example, and then turning around and saying, yes, they're going to have to pay a million dollars in order to access those very drugs. 
I think that's it's a little bit of an extension of what you're saying. Should the money go back to NHS? You know, what's the role of those individuals who participate in those kind of studies that uh, enable drugs to come to market, yeah, or vaccines to come to market, or any anything? Um, I, I think. Uh, uh, I agree. I think that uh, the, I, I, I think we, we, we spend a lot of time thinking in Sensein about how we do this. And we've, we felt, at least I felt very strongly, that if we then took that and salami sliced that value to individual levels, uh, one, we thought it would be very divisive because, in fact, it would take away the social purpose that some people feel that that comes with sharing the data. And also the sum of the data is more than its individual parts. That's the whole point of big data. So, the, so, the, so we, we found that it would be practically impossible to, for us to do. The, the, the value may become so small that no one values it at all. And it takes away the social purpose of combining because there is a value, both in emotional as well as financial value in combining things about cooperation about you know like old cooperative style thing this is an opportunity for us to reinvent that feeling in our community that together we are more powerful than we are as individuals at least in healthcare data space uh, i think that that is what we should be we should be aspiring towards thank you i think that's a great vision actually given the time uh, i think there's a wonderful vision at the end and gives us a good look into the future um, as we, are, as we are now at the end of our time, I first of all want to thank everybody for coming. It was really a pleasure uh, to have all of you here. And in particular, I want to thank uh, you, the panelists. I think uh, having you all at this panel was really our A-list. It was uh, really wonderful to have you. And thanks a lot. Given your busy schedules, we really do appreciate uh, that you made, made the time. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, much. Peter. Very well moderated. Thank you for inviting me. Thank all right. You. So I, uh, at that point, I want to say goodbye to everybody. Um, we will have another um, session on the um, Tech and Society uh, panel, but I think we will all be informed about that. So goodbye to everybody and uh, have a nice day. Thank you. All right. Thanks a lot. Thank you.